Thank you for joining the team at Hands-On Labs today for our webinar on the all-new digital physics course. We're excited to showcase the new digital curriculum we've curated to help instructors transition their course online in this time of COVID and beyond. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to review the webinar logistics and give a brief introduction on what you can expect throughout this presentation. We encourage our attendees to participate in the conversation by asking questions and sharing resources. Please use the chat function to join in the conversation. Be sure to toggle the window to all panelists and attendees if you'd like the entire group to see your comments. If you have any questions for Dr. Duane or any of our distance learning specialists on the panel today, please be sure to add those in the Q&A box. You can find this section in the toolbar and our dedicated representatives will be sure to answer them in real time. Our panelists today will address as many questions as possible. However, if we are unable to answer all of them due to time constraints, we'll be sure to include this information in our post webinar follow up email. All attendees will be entered into a raffle to win a $100 Amazon gift card and we'll share the lucky winner in addition to the webinar recording in that email as well. In just a second, we'll kick off the presentation with a quick poll to get our attendees engaged. To participate in the polling segment, submit your response when prompted with the poll pop up on screen. So what can you expect to see today? During our session, Dr. Duane is excited to explore the new ways instructors can bring their labs online. For those of you in the audience that haven't heard of hands-on labs before, we have always focused on the powerful combination between physical kits and rigorous online curriculum for higher ed institutions looking to offer a tactile lab experience for distance learners. Since COVID hit, We've redoubled our efforts to offer a robust library of digital course offerings that include virtual experiments designed to maintain as much tactile lab experience as possible in a virtual setting. During this presentation, we will cover the all new digital physics course from Hands On Labs and provide an inside look at the different types of simulations and virtual experiments included in the course. Now that we've covered the majority of our Zoom logistics, it's time to get you, our audience, involved. We've got a couple of poll questions for you today that will allow us to learn a little more about each of you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you. My name is Kate Runny Janzi, and I'm the Chief Academic Officer at Science Interactive Group. Uh, we're going to get the ball rolling today with our first polling question. So we want to know, is your institution offering online only, hybrid, or on-campus courses this fall? I'll give you a few minutes to go ahead and select your answer and we'll take a look at our demographics. Wow, so we've got a lot of folks who are moving into a hybrid um, uh, scenario this year. That's really exciting and a lot of online folks as well. Um, so moving on to our second question, what challenges are you currently facing with bringing your lab online? Once again, I'll give you a couple minutes to answer the question and then we'll see what the results are. Okay, so yeah, I definitely see that most of our participants are really interested in uh, finding out more information about recreating a tactile lab experience for remote learners. That's definitely something we'll be talking about today. Um, logistical issues, student engagement and retention are also great things to discuss. Um, and a lot of concern about rigor, which is something we hear very often when we are um, approaching a new digital lab for people who are new to teaching online. Um, so let's talk about the benefits of online learning. Um, as we know, a lot of the questions come in with safety and rigor, both things that we brought up here. Um, um, student engagement and retention, how do you keep those students who typically would be on campus and you can see as they're interacting with the lab materials, how do you make sure they're having that same engagement um, when they're online, that they're understanding what they're doing and um, making sure that we retain them throughout the, the, the course, as well as logistical issues, how to get kids in. Um, all really common challenges we hear about. So what are the benefits of online learning? Well, there's actually a lot um, and some that you may not necessarily think about. 
you know, a lot of folks think immediately about flexibility and expanding the access to their courses. So we see a lot of non-traditional students joining in online um, courses. Um, folks who couldn't necessarily come to campus during the times when a lab course would be taught. That brings in a diversity of perspectives because you have students who maybe haven't taken science courses in a few years, maybe are new to science courses, or even who have had life experience and worked maybe in a science industry and are now coming back to expand their um, knowledge. Uh, we find that many students, because of the shift online, uh, have improved time management skills and are very, uh, become very self-motivated. It also leads to students becoming very proactive about their education. Uh, because of that self-motivation and having to manage their time. Finally, um, through the use of um, the learning management system, uh, students can improve their virtual communication skills, especially if they have a digital lab partner, maybe that they're partnering up with, discussing their results with on a weekly basis. So we see a lot of improvement in those virtual, excuse me, those virtual communication skills. Now, many of you are very familiar with um, hands-on labs as a lab um, kit provider. Um, and uh, as you know, due to COVID, there's been a huge strain upon, upon the supply chains around the globe. Um, and we've been really faced with the challenge of sourcing materials with the uh, astronomical increase in distance learning occurring this year. Uh, so what we'll be presenting you today is actually our digital lab curriculum. Um, so these are fully digital labs for students who are taking physics courses um, to allow them to continue to have that lab experience um, even while kits are um, in short supply. I'm going to switch things over to our um, uh, chief resident scientist, Dwayne Cagle, and he'll take it away on today's online demo. Well, great. Thank you, Kate, for the warm welcome. And uh, we're all excited uh, that our attendees could join us today. Uh, we know you're very busy in prepping for the upcoming teaching term and all the challenges that that may present uh, due to your schools most likely shifting your courses online. So what I want uh, to share with you today, as Kate prefaced, is a walkthrough of a digital physics lab uh, in conjunction with our online uh, cloud-based lab manual platform that we called HOL Cloud. Uh, so what we're going to start with is we're going to pull up a live student instance uh, of our digital lab manual. So what you see on my screen now is the landing page for a student for their physics course. Uh, you'll notice there's a message from their instructor followed by their lessons uh, in the order that they are to complete them. Uh, so what we want to do, let me shift, I have and change to a different screen, I apologize. All right, here we go. Again, I apologize. Same view, just a different student. So what this student uh, is encountering on this screen is a list of both their prerequisite lessons and the lessons specific to their course in the order that they are designated to be completed. Uh, you'll notice by the green check marks uh, that the student has completed five of these lessons thus far. Uh, all of these lessons are gated uh, as determined by the instructor, meaning the student cannot begin a new lesson until they've completed uh, the prior assignment. So uh, here we see the student is ready to begin the torque and equilibrium digital physics lesson. And you'll notice when the student clicks the title uh, that that lesson is broken into three sections. Only the first section is accessible uh, to start, and that is labeled exploration. And when the student clicks on the exploration section, uh, they are presented with an estimated completion time, not only for this section, but the sections that follow. 
So the exploration should take the student about 30 minutes, followed by two hours and another 30 minutes. Uh, what we find for online science students is that time management is one of their biggest challenges. Uh, you know, they're not showing up for a predetermined one to two hours per week on campus uh, to complete their lab work. Uh, and because they're doing it on their own time, uh, it is imperative uh, that we notify the student well in advance of how much time they need to set aside to meet the deadlines that you, their instructor, uh, have set for their coursework. Following the time allocations are clearly defined learning objectives. Uh, these are modeled after Bloom's taxonomy and always begin with an active verb uh, and are stated in a precise manner that can be assessed uh, throughout the lab. Now, the first assessments that students are going to complete are before they even begin engaging with the curriculum. And those assessments are labeled test your knowledge. When the student clicks on the test your knowledge button, uh, they encounter a series of drag and drop questions. Uh, here you'll see this student has completed this first page of drag and drop questions, uh, and they have been provided with immediate feedback in the form of which ones they got correct and which ones they answered incorrectly. Now, the main point of these questions is for the student to become aware of any knowledge gaps they have before they begin the lab activity. You know, now hopefully you've covered the concepts for this lab in the lecture portion of your online course already. Uh, and if you have, this certainly goes a long ways into alerting the student to any concepts they're not yet familiar with. But just as importantly, if you haven't covered these laboratory topics yet in your lecture section and your student is working ahead, uh, this notifies the student of the concepts that they're going to need to understand uh, and will gain from the curriculum that we're about to provide them with before they get started with the procedures. Uh, now, typically, we have more than one of these drag and drop activities. So this particular one was matching terms with descriptions. Another example is for the student to categorize statements. So here the student was provided with four statements and they dragged those statements into the true and false categories um, and were provided again with immediate feedback. Now once the student completes the drag and drop activities, uh, they are ready to engage with the introductory or exploration uh, curriculum itself. So you can look at this as the introduction to a traditional chapter within a lab manual. And in the exploration section, we include all content and concepts that the student should be familiar with in very manageable blocks of text always accompanied by visual elements in the form of either diagrams that we see here or graphs. Uh, it could be high resolution photographs or even videos to help a student visually relate to the content as it is being provided within the text. Typically on page one, we'll have some really basic information that hopefully the student already understands, along with the requisite formulas that go along with those concepts, and then ending in a did you know fact. And a did you know fact is designed to allow the student to relate the concepts that they just encountered on the page with um, ideas and, and, and experiences that they're already familiar with. So here in this lab, we're talking about torque and equilibrium, uh, and we're relating that at the student level to steering wheel size in automobiles, and more importantly, in old automobiles that lacked power steering. Uh, and if some of you in attendance today are as old as I am, uh, you remember those, and you remember they had larger steering wheels than a lot of today's modern cars, and that's simply to provide more leverage uh, to turn the front wheels. Now, at the bottom of every exploration page, 
there is another assessment. And this assessment is called Question Time. And it is specifically designed to test the student's understanding of the concepts that were presented on that particular curriculum page. Now, the format of these questions is different. These are either true, false, or multiple choice. And the student simply clicks an answer, and then they are provided with, again, immediate feedback. So the student can immediately identify any knowledge gaps that may still exist. Uh, and here you see the student got this one correct. Uh, conversely, on question two, when the student answered, they answered incorrectly. Uh, and we always provide the correct answer to the student if they do answer incorrectly. Uh, here you'll see page two of the exploration content is getting a little more detailed, but still it is in the same format. Uh, very manageable blocks of text, always accompanied by graphic representations of those concepts, and then ending with a question time assessment. Now, due to our time limitations today, uh, I'm going to advance to another student's view, a student that has already completed everything in the exploration section. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that all pages in our lab manual are gated, meaning students cannot just page through and then begin the step-by-step -step procedures. Uh, they must complete all activities on every page before advancing. So if you'll bear with me just one moment, I'm going to stop this screen share and we'll move to a different student. Okay, so this particular student has completed the exploration section of the lab, meaning they've covered all the background content, uh, they've answered all the assessments at the bottom of each page. Uh, and once they do that, they encounter the second section of every lab manual chapter, and that is titled experimentation. And the experimentation section, as you might imagine, is where the student completes step-by-step -step procedures uh, they generate data, they analyze that data, uh, and then they explain what it all means. And we're going to see a very specific example of that now. So this particular exercise, titled, not surprisingly, Torque and Equilibrium, is a simulation exercise. And we partnered with the PHET of the University of Colorado in Boulder uh, to use the physics simulations that they've developed with ver a very unique set of instructions uh, and expectations of the students uh, using our lab manual in conjunction with these simulations. Now, if you've explored these simulations in the past as a physics educator, you know that the simulations as they exist specifically uh, through FET, uh, they don't come with instructions. Uh, if you were to just give the student the simulation uh, window to use, uh, it wouldn't make much sense to the student. Uh, the good news is these simulations designed by FET are very sophisticated. Uh, they generate quite a bit of data. Uh, they usually have multiple windows within a given simulation. Uh, so once a lab manual exercise has been developed around one facet of the simulation, uh, the student does achieve uh, a very high level of outcomes and learning uh, from the interaction. So all of these simulations are embedded uh, within given exercises. The student just needs to click uh, the simulation button and they are taken directly to that environment. Now, in this particular set of instructions, this is a little more advanced for the student, uh, so the intro is not going to be used in this particular exercise, uh, but one of the actual uh, events itself is. And then we'll see that the student is instructed exactly how to prepare 
the embedded tools within this simulation uh, to achieve the outcomes that they're going to need. So for example, the student is going to need to check the series of the, the boxes and the presets and change the way uh, the balancing mechanism functions uh, for this particular exercise. So we can go in and we can do that uh, here as a student, just as prescribed in the lab manual. And once we get it set up properly, and you'll see that the student is provided with a visual confirmation uh, within the lab manual itself to assure that they set up the simulation properly. Uh, then they're given step-by-step -step instructions on how to manipulate the various factors within the simulation to generate the data that they will need to then analyze uh, for this particular lab. So I'm not going to run through all of these instructions for time's sake, uh, but what the student is doing in this simulation is that they are placing a series of objects on the ruler here, along with a series of known masses And then uh, by trial and error, not unlike they would do in a on-campus lab environment, uh, they are moving the masses in, until uh, the, the torque equilibrium is achieved, uh, at, the end, at which time they're asked to record their data. And uh, the data tab in the lab manual resides in the lower right hand corner. Now when the student clicks that, the data tab expands to fill their screen. And this is very important for a couple of reasons. One, this is all digitized, meaning the student is not required to access additional software to complete their lab ex exercise, meaning uh, this does not reside on a Word document. Uh, this does not reside in an Excel file uh, or anything like that. So if the student is using a mobile device, such as a tablet, to complete their assignment, they do not need to have additional software installed on that device. Uh, all they need to do is simply type in their answers and you'll see the green saved tab in the upper right of my shared screen as I'm doing this. And this is important so that students' work is always automatically saved. They do not need to hit a save function. If they lose connectivity for any reason, they have not lost their work. A student will continue uh, adjusting the simulation as directed and then returning to the data tab as needed to save additional work. Uh, once the student has completed uh, all the steps in the simulation, they are required to analyze the data that has been generated from the simulation software. Uh, and then with their data set and with the formulas that they are provided, uh, they complete their analyses and record their calculations again in the automated data table. At the completion of all of their analyses, the students encounter a series of open-ended questions designed for the student to relate their experimental outcomes to the topic central to this lab topic chapter itself. Uh, and again, these response panels are automatically saved. So, and again, as the student types them, you'll see the green saved uh, uh, notification appears every three seconds. So again, uh, there's no fear in the student losing their work. Uh, here you'll see this particular question uh, is a very open-ended question. It's asking a student to refer back to their t data table and explain 
in, on, in relation to the concepts, again, presented in the lab. Now, once the student completes all the exercises associated with a particular topic uh, and has completed their data tables and answered those open-ended summative assessments, uh, they are then allowed to access the third and final section of the lab titled evaluation. And the evaluation section uh, begins again with a time notification, immediately followed by a review of all learning objectives uh, for both the exploration section and the experimentation sections. Uh, once a student has a chance to review those learning objectives and confirm on their own that they have achieved those desired outcomes, they are ready to start the evaluation. You'll notice the student immediately receives a notification that they will be locked out of the lab itself as soon as they start this evaluation, meaning they can't toggle back to their data tables or their answers to any of the previous questions or the content itself, and that this is truly a closed book exam. They're also notice, notified that they are on a timer. Now, the timer is not going to stop after a certain interval, uh, but the student is made aware that their, uh, their efforts are being timed. All right, so these questions, consists exclusively of multiple choice or truth-false responses. Uh, and these questions all relate to a specific learning objective and to specific content that was provided either in the exploration section of the lab manual or within the step-by-step -step procedures and the, the results. So once a student clicks an answer, they hit next, they're taken to the next question, and they continue this process. Now, I'm going to do this very randomly for time's sake, uh, but I want to share with you how the feedback and remediation for each of these questions is automated. And to do that, we need to advance through all the questions. So this particular evaluation exam had nine questions. Uh, before a student finish, completes their uh, assessments, they are given a final notification that once they click finish, they cannot go back and change any answers. Um, we're going to finish ours. And now we are provided with feedback and remediation for our answers to the questions. So you'll see that we started out with me paying a little bit of attention and we got some of them right. And then once it went random, well, not surprisingly, we messed those. But what I wanna draw your attention to uh, is two things. One, for your students, uh, yes, they can immediately identify the ones they answered correctly. Uh, but even on their correct answers, uh, they are able to relate which learning objective they successfully achieved. Uh, more importantly, for incorrect answers, not only are students provided with feedback and what the correct answer should have been, but they're also provided with remediation in this review statement. So the student is able to then, at the completion of this exam, go back and review these concepts that they answered incorrectly uh, and cover the material again. So even though they can't retake this test, uh, at least the lesson is unlocked and they can still go back and for a final time, hopefully uh, have the knowledge gained that, that, that was intended all along. Now, at the conclusion of the student reviewing their final exam results, uh, they are given the opportunity to answer one or more extension questions. And these questions are very unique. Uh, and use it for you, an educator, they may be unique too. Uh, and that these questions are designed for a student to apply the knowledge they've gained from completing the lab to address a new concept. Uh, so the, the lab, as we page through the exploration section and that one example of procedures, 
uh, was certainly about torque and equilibrium, uh, but it was using a balanced board. Uh, and now, a student is asked to apply their understanding of torque and equilibrium to explain how bicycle crank functions and how if the length of the crank arm is changed, uh, how that changes the torque uh, on the system. Uh, so, you know, something that uh, we might be expected to use in real life as scientists one day, or certainly a wonderful opportunity for the student to not only demonstrate how much they understand and how they can apply that knowledge, but also for a student to really understand at the end of the day what their new knowledge means to them and, and what it means to their future endeavors. Uh, again, these questions are always open-ended. We've seen how they function before. Uh, the student's work is auto-saved as they enter their responses. The student, though, on this one has the opportunity to check their answer. So if I type in a sample answer, and let's see if it's going to let us check or not. I think yes. And so uh, the student is then given the expected answer, uh, meaning what the solution is to this problem. And, and so they get feedback yet again. And if they can then uh, understand, uh, again, if they fully understand this concept to the level that they can apply it. Lastly, the student signs an authentic authentication statement uh, and they submit a final report of all of their answers. Uh, this is now available for their instructor to both view and grade within the HOL Cloud Lab Manual platform. So this concludes an, a student walkthrough of an example of a digital physics lab using a simulation through PHET uh, of CU Boulder. Uh, I want to take just a few minutes uh, after this to show you some tools that we have integrated into our HOL Cloud platform that are there for instructors to customize our content uh, for your class and to assess your students uh, within the platform and to very importantly integrate this lab manual tool within your existing learning management system. But, but before we go there, I'm just going to take a very quick break. Uh, and while I do that, uh, I will take this opportunity to answer any student experience questions that may have come through to the panelists uh, during this part of the presentation. Hey, Dwayne. All right. So some of the questions that we've got so far um, uh, is, uh, is HOL designed for students to learn on their own? Uh, if yes, what is the instructor's role here? That is a phenomenal question. So we're going to see a little bit more about the instructor's role uh, when we take a preview of the instructor tools uh, that I just promised. But yes, our lab manuals are all-encompassing and stand alone. Uh, they're textbook agnostic. Uh, they're agnostic to the lecture portion of your course even. And what I mean by that is we've included uh, all the important concepts that the student needs to understand to be successful with the procedures and the, the data analyses within the exploration section of the lab manual. Uh, so, what we know about online students from over 20 years of being in this business is that quite often they work ahead of the lecture section of their course due to a variety of factors. Uh, and for those students, it's imperative that we pro make the, con the, the content stand independently uh, so that they can be successful if they are working ahead. Now, as an instructor, Using the tools that we have built in just for you into this platform, you can go in and customize the content, uh, meaning you can add supplemental information uh, within the lab manual itself. And you can also create unique exercises and lab manual chapters altogether for your course. And then lastly, uh, you will provide a level of grading 
for your students. Uh, not on those auto graded questions. So any of the multiple choice, the drag and drop type questions that provide the student with immediate feedback and let them know what they got correct and incorrect, those require no grading from you. Uh, however, the data tables and those open-ended summative assessments at the end of the procedure pages, uh, those are for you to grade. So, so a little bit of work on your part, uh, but for the most part, this lab manual is standalone. Uh, your students can be successful uh, on their own, and it allows you to focus on the lecture portion of your course or just interacting with your online students uh, in whatever modality uh, you prefer. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And then another big question is, are all of the labs based on the uh, Colorado FET simulations? And are there any original ones or actual measurement labs? So uh, that's a wonderful question. So these labs fall into uh, two categories when it comes to simulations and then four or well, three categories overall. So so a majority of the labs that we're offering uh, in this digital experience for your students this fall uh, are simulation-based labs, not unlike the one we've just seen. About half of those are FET simulations, and the other half are the physics aviary simulations. You may be familiar with, with those two. In both of these simulations, they function in that students go in and they change settings and variables based on the lab manual instructions. And then both of these branded simulations, if you will, provide output data for the student. It has always been the student's responsibility to analyze that data uh, to get the desired results and then obviously explain those results uh, in light of the concepts central to the lab. Uh, other labs within this collection of experiments uh, are for students to use very minimal materials that they provide uh, to make calculations, uh, manipulate data sets, uh, go through various graphing exercises, uh, draw various vac vectors uh, and things such as that. And then the final subset of labs uh, are students using, again, materials they should readily have on hand to explore things like experimental errors uh, and variability, so like various timing events, for example. So students are actually creating their own data sets in these instances and analyzing those data sets um, based on how they collected that data and, and the error that is inherent to it. So, so a little bit of everything. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. D. Um, one more, um, will there be a way to get these simulations? Oh, my apologies. Is there a way for the students to get graded on their experiment data? What is there to stop a student from just putting random numbers in the data table to just get to the assessment portion? So, so being a scientist, uh, I, I hope I don't upset you by, by saying our company's policy is we don't grade data automatically. Uh, so, it's the student's responsibility to put the data in the data tables. It is my responsibility as a curriculum developer to provide you, the instructor, with an answer key for the data tables and, very importantly, an answer key for those open-ended assessments at the conclusion of the procedures. Uh, it, but it's up to you as an educator and the instructor for that student to determine how you want to grade that data and how you want to grade those open-ended assessments. Like I said, I provide you with a guide that you can easily align uh, to the student's answers. Um, but again, uh, there's gonna always be variability in data that is student-generated, if we're talking about measurement data. Uh, within these simulations, not so much variability. Uh, I, I've seen it in a couple of them, 
but for the most part, the simulations put out a pretty standardized data set if the student follows the instructions correctly and sets up all the presets parameters correctly. Um, so grading that data should be straightforward for you, the instructor, if we're regarding if we're talking about the simulation generated data. Now, student generated data again, that that's up to you. I I can't dictate how you grade that. So, but I do provide you with an ideal answer in every scenario. Fantastic. Do we have time for just a couple more questions? Uh, let me let me get on to showing these instructor tools, and I'll, I'll promise I'll wrap up in time that we can answer any residual questions at that point in time. Does that sound fair? Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. D. All right. So bear with me, audience. We're going to stop and start a screen share again. Um, All right, so here is the instructor view, which I accidentally started with at the beginning of the presentation a few moments ago, and I apologize. Uh, and I want to just go over what's different for instructors on the HOO Cloud Lab Manual platform versus students and the tools that are associated with that. Uh, so here we see the same landing page that the student encountered. Uh, the difference being is that as an instructor, I can leave these notes for my students. I can delete old notes, uh, and I can go in and save new notes to my students. Uh, and then that connects with them in real time. So meaning the next time they log on to their lab manual, they will see my most recent communication. Uh, you'll notice that as an instructor, I'm not locked out of the labs. I can access any of these labs at any time and I can access any section of any lab at any time. Uh, I can also reorder the labs for my students. Uh, so I can change it up at any point in time in the semester even if I choose. But for consistency's sake, let's go into the same lab that we viewed as a student a few minutes ago. And when we do that, and take my system just a second, uh, we'll see some things are very similar. So this landing page is similar. You know, the, the test your knowledge activities are similar. So you, the instructor, sees what the student encounters. But what's different is, again, there's no gating. So as an instructor, you can jump around to any page you want. You're not required to answer those questions in any, in any sequence. Um, and then once you're on a content page in the exploration section, uh, you do have a slightly different experience in that as you hover over the content, uh, you're going to notice not only this pointer, but you'll notice these pulsing blue bars between every text and image panel. And these pulsing blue bars allow you, the instructor, to add supplemental content anywhere you choose on any given page. That content can be text in nature, so you can just type in text, uh, or it can be, as we saw here, images. You can drag and drop a JPEG or a PNG or even a GIF file if you choose. Or lastly, you can upload videos. Uh, and videos just need to be an MP4 file. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about videos in that we've designed our hosting platform for videos uh, to be ADA compliant, meaning it has closed captioning and it has uh, video descriptive text in it. So I would encourage you uh, to be mindful of that if you do want to upload a video and, and take the time to create those ancillary files. We have certainly created them uh, when we upload videos for your students uh, within the platform. But as soon as you save your work uh, as anything that you upload for the students, again, in real time, it appears for your students within the content of their lab manual. Now, this is not only for the exploration section, but 
you also have this opportunity within the step-by-step -step procedures. So if you remember, when we clicked on this FET simulation a few minutes ago for the torque exercise, uh, you'll notice it had several modes to it, and we clicked on that middle mode, the balance board mode. Uh, but we could have just as easily clicked on one of the other two modes of that simulation. Uh, you could do that still, and you could write specific instructions for one of those other modes of the simulations for your student, and it's automatically integrated into the existing lab manual chapter. Uh, so you have a lot of flexibility as an educator uh, in using the content uh, that has already been published uh, up on HOL Cloud. And again, your efforts will be immediately viewable by your students uh, when they next visit their curriculum. So let's talk about some other tools that we have created for you, and I'm just going to cover a couple of these, the ones I promised you, although there, as you can see, there's a whole variety of instructor tools. Uh, I want to talk about Gradebook uh, since we brought that up already. And you'll notice that there are five students in this demo course, and they're all very famous people. Uh, you'll probably recognize these names. Uh, obviously, this is in jest. Uh, we can't use real student names uh, for, for various legal reasons. Uh, but you'll, you'll see our cast of characters here has completed, uh, all have completed five of the labs. And you'll notice that in these bubbles, there are numbers assigned. And that means not only have the students submitted their work, but their instructor has gone in and given them a total grade for that. And that total grade consists not only of those auto-graded multiple choice and drag and drop responses by the student, uh, but also the data tables that we talked a little bit about and those open-ended questions. Now, as an instructor, you get to set all this up how you want it to function the first time you teach your course, uh, meaning you get to choose not only per lab chapter, such as torque and equilibrium, how many total points you want your students to achieve, but within that chapter, you have an opportunity to go in and adjust the point value of every student response. And that includes the auto-graded questions. If you recall, they're labeled test your knowledge and question time and competency review. Uh, the defaults are one point each, but you can go in and change that. And then you can also assign default point values to the data tables and those open-ended questions. So there's no rules here. Uh, whatever you want to do is right for you and your students. Uh, and then once you actually go into one of the data tables, for example, uh, let's do that. Here is that integrated answer key that I promised you. So here are all the correct answers for the calculations using the measurements or the data that was generated by the simulation. Uh, so it's very easy then for you to assess your students' outcomes for, for that data table one, uh, based on the data that we provided from, from creating the exercise. And same thing goes for those open-ended questions. Again, we provided what we consider the ideal student response for these, uh, and it allows you to then compare uh, to the response that your students provide and then assign them a point value at that point in time. So that's an example of some grading tools that are integrated into the platform. Now, the, the question that always comes after that is, well, if I use the platform for grading, how do I get those grades into my LMS at my institution? Well, you do that through LMS integration services, which comes standard with our HOL cloud platform. And those tools are located under the settings function for you, the instructor. And you'll see on there uh, that there is a show LTI credentials. 
And all you need to do is share these credentials with your IT professionals uh, at your institution, and they can set it up so not only that your grades port back and forth, but also that you can break up the lab manual itself and segregate each chapter individually within your learning management system environment. So if you want your students to first cover the lecture portion for that TORC lab, and then within your learning management environment, see a link to the lab portion of that topic that is easily accommodated through learning management system integration. So again, all the tools are here for you, the instructor. And the last thing I want to show you, is something I can't really show you, but, but I want to share with you, is I think a very exciting thing, certainly in today's times, uh, with the HOL Cloud platform is we offer you, the instructor, custom lesson authoring functionality, meaning that we allow you to not only, as we've seen before already, take our existing lessons and add supplemental content within them, but we allow you to create custom lessons for your students on maybe topics that we don't offer. Or um, maybe you want to create just a custom assessment for the semester overall for the lab portion. Uh, really, the sky's the limit here. Uh, within this custom lesson authoring environment, you have access to all the tools that our team at Hands-On Lab uses when we create the curriculum originally. So you can create your own questions. You can create your own drag and drop activities, uh, your own content your own exercises, your own competency review exams, uh, any of the, the features you saw when we pre previewed that TORC lab, uh, all of the feature creation tools are available to you, the instructor. So you can add unique topics and intersperse them within the existing lab manual uh, as you may require. So this is a very open platform. Uh, for you to use as best meet the needs of your course and most importantly, your online students. So at this point, I'm going to stop my screen share. I think Amanda, our host, may have one or more final slides uh, that she would like to cover. And then uh, we will answer in the limited time we have left any residual questions that you may have that the, the, the panelists were not able to answer up until this point in time. Great, thank you, Duane. Uh, a couple of questions that I've got here are, are these uh, lessons calculus-based or are they more basic algebra trig level? Uh, it depends on the lesson. That's a very good question and we get that a lot. Um, so it depends on the lesson. We have some optional computational activities uh, in the exercises for labs that can use calculus. Uh, they're not mandatory, and there, there's a, a note before that portion of a procedure that, that notifies the student that if your instructor uh, wishes for calculus to be used to make these, you know, this subset of calculations, uh, you know, please proceed. If not, you may omit this section. Obviously, in any of those labs, the instructor can go in and leave a personalized note, as we've seen with the tools I've already discussed. Uh, but by default, we, we do not want to assume that every institution that uses one of our labs requires calculus. So anytime that we offer uh, that basis of calculations in there, we're always going to put a footnote by them uh, for the student to confirm with their instructor that they need to, to complete that particular activity. Fantastic, thank you. Um, one more question is how, uh, how, do the stu how do we calculate errors? What is the accepted uh, value if, there, if it is a simulation? Well, I mean, these simulations, like I said, give really standardized output in my experience. I've, I've never seen it vary 
by more than a you know a hundredth of a, whatever the measurement factor is. So so there really isn't the traditional error rates as would be generated by a student manually taking measurements. Um, but but we see that in a real lab. You know, if we're using sophisticated timing equipment, our error rates are, are pretty small on the measurements themselves versus if students are, are measuring these things on their own. So again, with these simulations, the error rates are negligible. I, I would have no issues as an instructor for the simulation-based labs taking the answer keys for the data tables that's generated by by us, the curriculum developers, in, in using that de facto to grade students. Wonderful. Okay. Um, it looks like that may be all the time we have for today, unless there are any last minute questions. Um, anything that we don't address today in the webinar, we of course will be uh, addressing in our follow up email. Is there anyone else? All right, it looks like one last question. Will all labs for physics one and two be ready for fall 2020 semester on time? And I'm assuming that uh, Mahmoud is referring to our virtual options. Well, I, I mean, the list that we provided our, our uh, learning specialist who work with clients is complete at this time. So uh, all I can say is what, what's on the list is available for the fall, so. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. D. Um, You're very welcome. All right, guys. Um, can, is there any way you can elaborate on the student-generated data set real quick before we wrap up? Elaborate on student-generated data sets? Yes. So, for, for example, a students are required to time a, a free-falling object manually. Uh, this exercise is very purposeful to show uh, to demonstrate error rates specifically in manually timed events uh, that not surprisingly is in the intro to experimental errors uh, lab and so that's a very specific example there it, students drop different objects uh, they use digital timers uh, but the timing itself the start stop is relying upon the student these are not photo gates so, um, so that's one specific example. All right. Thank you, Dr. D. So unfortunately, we're going to stop here because our time has run out. We've had some amazing questions. We'll be addressing those in our follow-up email. Um, so don't worry, you'll see that soon. You'll receive a list of resources and common questions regarding all of the new digital physics course and uh, to make your pivot online more seamless uh, process. A big thanks to all of our panelists today and an even bigger thanks to you, the instructors who continue to educate the scientists of tomorrow, regardless of the circumstances today.